Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for the ongoing series of Military Aviation Museum webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the museum. This week, uh, we're looking specifically in depth at the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, tonight, we're going to be joined by filmmakers Derek Greer and Paul Glenshaw. Um, they're both labeled as Paul currently, but Paul is on your left, Derek is on your right. And uh, they're going to be talking to us about their upcoming documentary, uh, the poster for which is in Paul's background. Um, hopefully you've all had the chance to enjoy the 20-minute the version that they were gracious enough to share with all of us uh, free of charge on YouTube. Um, and they're going to tell us a little bit about how the coronavirus has impacted their film's rollout and everything. But I think ahead of that, um, they've got a special celebratory toast that they want to offer this evening. So hopefully you've uh, got your champagne and uh, cognac ready. Uh, Derek, Paul, if you're ready, we're ready. Indeed. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Happy Hour with the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, it's four o'clock out here in California, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one from the team and, uh, and join you for an early cocktail. A very simple cocktail, half champagne and half cognac. Uh, however, I would recommend doing uh, maybe a quarter cognac uh, instead of half because it's, uh, it's a little strong. Uh, this is a cocktail that uh, Paul and I discovered in France. And hold on, let me get my Martel VSOP in here. So I'd like to lead a toast to the Military Aviation Museum and to the memory of the Lafayette Escadrille, Santé. So Paul and I were in France, in Paris, and we had heard of the legendary Harry's Bar. Uh, located um, at uh, Rue Saint Donu uh, in the uh, near the opera, near the Paris Opera, and we went in unannounced and asked the bartender if we could film him making a French 75, and he agreed. We set up the camera. Uh, French 75 was named for the largest artillery shell of the French artillery um, because apparently they both have the same effect on you. And so I directed Jerry. I said, so Jerry, it's half uh, French 75, is half champagne, half cognac. And he said, oh, I, I can't make that. I said, well, no, it's very simple. It's half champagne, half cognac. I, I can't make that. That's not a French 75. I said, well, uh, no, we have it right here. We have it right here in Ted Parsons' book. And I looked it up, and I'd gotten the name wrong. Uh, this is about William Thaw, the founding member of the Lafayette Escadrille. Thaw should have had at least one more medal. With Lufberry, he was the inventor and chief exponent of that very dynamic concoction known as the Lafayette cocktail. And, Le and Jerry said, oh, I can make that if it's called the Lafayette cocktail. It was composed of equal parts of brandy and champagne. This soothing mixture with the kick of a mule brought him and many another good man down where the Bosch failed. And uh, on page... 194, there's one other mention. Visiting Brass Hats were our special delight, for in order to maintain our reputation as perfect hosts, we pressed unlimited quantities of the extremely dynamic Lafayette cocktail on them. We were accustomed to it and knew when to quit, but after they had gotten over the shock of the first drink, there seemed to be no limit to their thirst until the inevitable result. We always had spare beds ready for emergencies. So again, Santé, and Paul, let's take a little trip to France. Thank you, Derek, and uh, thank you all for having us uh, this evening. We're very happy to be able to um, <coughs> present a little behind the scenes look at, uh, at the process of making this film. Uh, the third name you see there on the screen, Matthew Maza, is our, our cinematographer who occasionally makes this presentation with us. Uh, for those of you who know this place, this is uh, of the very beautiful uh, memorial to the Lafayette Flying Corps and Lafayette Escadrille, just outside Paris, uh, near Versailles, a place called Marne-la-Coquette. More on that soon. Uh, this film took us four years to make, and, and we should say that we have completed a two-hour feature-length documentary, which we'll talk about the premiere of that film a little later on, but it was four years in the making. Um, 
and certainly one of the most important aspects about making the film was being in France itself. And so this is a photograph of us, uh, Derek, Mathieu, and myself on the Plateau Californie, uh, right near the, in the Chemin de Dam sector, uh, just above the little town of Crayonel. And Paul, I forget why it was named after California, because it was so beautiful. Was there gold nearby? Uh, do you remember the story of that? My recollection is that uh, there was an estate there owned by a man who'd made some money in the gold rush, uh, the California gold rush. But I, but don't quote me on that. That's yeah. No, I, I think you're right. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about production first. Uh, we began actually. This is our sort of first day of shooting in January 2016. Um, oh no, this is in April 2016. We we began the process in January. Um, and we went to France for the first time, uh, supported by a very generous grant from the Florence Gould Foundation, to go and do some scouting, but most importantly, to film the rededication of the Lafayette Escadrille Memorial. It had fallen into terrible disrepair, and the French and American governments coordinated and raised the money to have it completely restored and transferred the ownership from the private foundation that had held it since the 1920s to the American Battlefield Monument Commission. And so there was going to be an enormous ceremony rededicating the memorial, French military, American military, uh, Lafayette Escadrille family members. And even though we didn't have a script and we had not really mapped out the whole film yet, we knew that we had to shoot this. So we actually shot the end of the movie, uh, it was the very first thing. Uh, it was really an extraordinary event. It was held 100 years after the formation of the escadrille itself. And uh, there to were the to the day. And there were uh, a, a very large number of members of the Lafayette Escadrille, family members of the Lafayette Escadrille who were there. And these are people who we've become very close to over the last years in, in learning to tell this story and to tell it properly. Um, and to tell it with accuracy and authenticity. So to have their support, and uh, they've supported us in a great number of ways, uh, moral support, being interviewees, sharing collections, and we'll get to all of that in a little bit. Um, but just a few words about who some of these people are. In the top left of your screen, you see Guillaume de Ramel, who is uh, the great grandnephew of the co-founder of the Escadrille, Norman Prince. Uh, Guillaume and his identical twin brother are both pilots. You see a carbon cub in the background there that Guillaume built himself. He also flies a T-6 and a couple of other airplanes. Um, and it was really through their innate love of aviation that they became curious about the story of Norman Prince, which had kind of dropped out of favor in the family. Um, and so they were very much involved in this. Below him is Alexander Truitt, who is the grand uh, ne grand niece, excuse me, of Jim McConnell, and uh, she grew up knowing that Uncle Jim was probably the most important uh, character in her family's history, and had a tremendous impact on her own father. And so, uh, you know, a very personal uh, story from her. But perhaps there was, no more per there was no more personal story than the one we got from Caroline Bridgman, who's in the top right. And she is the daughter of Ray Bridgman, who was one of the Escadri pilots. Um, and, you know, to, to, we've actually found four living children of the Lafayette Escadrille and uh, interviewed two of them, Caroline being one. And um, her father took his own life in 1951. And, and she spoke very clearly and very movingly about that. Uh, about how it was hard for him after the war. Um, he was actually a committed pacifist who joined the Lafayette Escadrille and fought, uh, he shot down four Germans and uh, a very brave guy, but um, uh, a very, a very, uh, a very personal and very human story. Below her is Lieutenant Colonel Nic Nicholas Rutgers, who is a squadron commander for the Oregon Air National Guard and the fourth uh, fourth generation of American um, military pilots in one family. His great grandfather was James Norman Hall, uh, one of the most celebrated members of the Lafayette Escadrille. And his grandfather flew in World War II and his father flew in Vietnam and he is uh, the commander of an F-15 squadron and flies them himself. 
this is our second trip to France, uh, two years later in, um, in 2018. Uh, a French general, uh, Daniel Bastian in the upper left-hand corner, leaning over the table, we'll, we'll meet him a little later. Right below him is Jean-Patrice Lassaint, who's the commander of the airfield at luxeuil le bain which is the very first uh, air base that the Lafayette Escadrille served in. And that air base was built there in preparation for World War I. And it was far in enough from the Western Front, from the line of the Western Front, uh, to be rather safe, but they could still get there to fight. Um, in the upper right-hand corner are Andre and Michelle Spetz, who are amateur historians and um, have devoted a lot of their time and energy to the study of Kiffin Rockwell, who uh, crashed his plane about 150 yards behind where they're standing. Uh, they've written a children's book about him, and every year they get together for a dedication to him in a park where there's a lovely little uh, memorial stone. And uh, we were there for that. We'll see that later. And in the lower right is um, Jean-Marc Simon, another amateur historian uh, from Ham, France, H-A-M, uh, which was one of the toughest places where the Lafayette Escadrille served and uh, where four of the pilots uh, crashed and died. And uh, Jean-Marc has done a great deal of work in researching their lives and where the airfield was, which he's standing uh, right in front of in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, this is Paul interviewing uh, General Yvon Goot, a two-star uh, general and the past president of the Lafayette Association, which are all veterans uh, that flew for a squadron, a French squadron, that is still named for the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, he's wearing a Lafayette Escadrille shirt and hat. And uh, this interview is at Saint-Dizier, which is a big air base. And there was an air show going on at the time. And Paul had the very difficult time of monitoring uh, Yvonne's questions in between sounds of jet planes taking off overhead. But uh, he was a very valuable contributor uh, to us and actually made several phone calls while we were there and got us um, unfettered um, introductions to several air bases in France where we filmed. And later on, we brought him to Dayton, Ohio for our premiere. So as Derek said, um, we made two trips to France and <clears throat> it was incredibly important for us, especially for our American audiences, to have a very strong sense of place in the film. Um, one of the challenges in reaching American audiences about World War I stories, the general public, is there's not typically a, a, a great understanding of the war or remembrance of the war. For example, the World War I Centennial Commission has been working tirelessly to get a national memorial in the nation's capital to the war. It still is uh, yet to be um, completed. But uh, so, so, and it's understandable because the war happened in France. It didn't happen here. And so it was very important for us to go to the places where things actually happened. And uh, here we are in um, the little town of Corsieux. France, which is in eastern, northeastern France. And where we're standing there with General Bastien, who Derek, Derek mentioned before, is in the parking lot of the President Brand, uh, che Brand Cheese Factory. Um, if, you, they, if you go to the supermarket and see President Brand Brie Cheese, it's made here in this little village. And um, he's standing in front of a yellow house. And he recognized this house in a photograph of the crash of Norman Prince. And then using maps, of the electrical system, uh, a system of wires uh, over Corsia from the time he determined where the photograph was taken and where the airplane hit the ground. And that's where we're standing. So when Daniel Bastien tells the story of Norman's crash, he's standing in the place where it happened. So there's a very specific example of the kind of, uh, the level of detail we went to, to, to bring our audience to the place where, where, the, where the story actually occurred. Uh, this is our production uh, map from Google Earth. Uh, after our first trip to France, we did most of our location scouting via Google Earth um, to 
find all the places where the Lafayette Escadrille was uh, during their time in France, which included some on the southwestern coast and right on the, in the south of France during training. But to make our production efficient we, uh, as possible, we concentrated on where they actually flew and fought, um, as well as locations inside Paris. Um, we have to thank the um, German reconnaissance pilots of the First World War, uh, who flew over the air bases of their uh, foes, the French, uh, in order to bomb them. Um, because these photographs are incredibly uh, clear and they gave us the opportunity to overlay them on images of Google Earth. So what you're looking at right here is the little village of Bayonne, which is the first, which is the air base they flew out of when they were flying over Verdun, the Battle of Verdun. It's right near the town of Bar-le-Duc. So that's the Google Earth image. Here's the German reconnaissance photograph. And if I can point with my mouse, I hope you might be able to see this. See so this road right here, we'll take that one as an example. It matches up exactly to the Google Earth image. Same up here, same over here. And so with those markers, I would look at the bend in the road here. Oops, excuse me, jumped ahead. See that bend in the road? It matches up exactly. So we were able to see that, yes, exact. this is where the hangars were, and here's the airfield where they flew. Oh, I keep doing this, excuse me. When we go to the actual place, there's a little housing development there, but this portion of the field here is still a field. So when we came to shoot here, we parked right here in this corner, and that's where we flew the drone. Um, so when we're talking about flying towards Verdun, we're talking about flying from the spot where they flew as close as we could possibly get. And this is the house where the Lafayette Escadrille stayed while they were stationed at Bayonne, and it's on a ridge overlooking Bar-le-Duc. Uh, on our first trip, we arrived in Bar-le-Duc, knew they stayed somewhere, uh, but we met the lovely hostess and owner of a great restaurant that we ate in, and she said, well, there's an historian in town who would know which house it was. And he worked in a camera shop. And indeed, that's how we found this house. Uh, we met the owner and luckily he had a fire going. So we were able to get um, a really nice shot of the, uh, the chateau, uh, the last um, beautiful place in which they stayed um, before they really got into the war. And indeed, it was from here that they, they flew into Verdun. Now, this next picture, is a rather fame is of a very nondescript uh, street, but it is the location of this photograph that Lafayette Escadrille historians had wondered about for a long time. And we showed it to General Daniel Bastian, and five minutes later, he wrote us back and said, Here it is, uh, through the shadows and some sort of triangulation, being a reconnaissance uh, Air Force general in France, he was able to determine that this was the location, which is right around the corner from the Chateau. So in 2016, when Paul and I were there, had we walked 100 feet to our right, we would have looked up the street and seen where the location was. Uh, the gentleman right in the center there in the black uniform is Charles Nungesser, who was the fourth highest scoring ace uh, in France. And he was injured, I think for the fourth time, with a broken leg and a wired jaw, and he was supposed to be on R and R, so he just hung out and flew with the Lafayette Escadrille for two weeks as he was getting better uh, before he rejoined his squadron. Uh, and that's Norman Prince on the far left, and Didier Masson, a uh, French American, on the far right. Uh, this is something that, this is probably the most colorful example of something that we saw a lot of in France. And uh, this was this was taken at a ceremony um, uh, in Rodorin. Derek mentioned it before when we were talking about Andre and Michelle Spetz and how they have a park and a, and a commemoration every year. Well, we went and filmed the commemoration and it's um, a moment when, they're, when they honor local French uh, veterans of the French military uh, who are given uh, decorations. Um, but it, the centerpiece is the little uh, marker to Kiffin Rockwell. And you can see a young person standing there in a blue, light blue shirt holding a flute. Uh, she's the member of a 
an American high school band that tours France every summer and comes to Rotorin to participate in this. So this is an event that was not put on for our cameras. This was an event that was happening anyway, regardless of whether the cameras were there or not. And you see the American flags and the French military flags. And it was an incredibly moving um, uh, experience to be with these folks who are commemorating the uh, sacrifice of the young Americans who flew for France in World War I and how that memory stays alive. And, and we found this in big ways and small ways all across France. Uh, you know, uh, Memorial This happens every year. And, yeah. and there are several uh, graves of the Lafayette members uh, and memorials um, over there. And, you know, Paul and I came upon them uh, with nobody knowing, and there were fresh flowers uh, on these graves. The French have not forgotten. Yep. Um, and uh, I wish we could see you all and uh, have you raise your hands and, and uh, see how many of you have actually been to Verdun, the uh, site of the, the, the most, one of the, arguably the, the worst battle of the war um, that happened in 1916. Um, and it was in 2016 that we visited Verdun for the first time and had a day long tour of the place. And, and my own personal experience was that although I had read a lot about World War I and a lot about the Lafayette Escadrille, it wasn't until I went to Verdun that I got a real uh, feeling, visceral feeling about the war itself and the, the scale of it and how devastating it was. Um, it's, it's an incredibly moving place to be. Um, and so we were fortunate when we went back in, in um, 2017 that um, when we went there, it was raining. Um, there were no tourists. There was virtually no one there. And to film Verdun empty in the rain um, was something we couldn't, it, it, it really brought home the, the solemnity of the place in a way that, that we really couldn't have ordered up any better. It was really interesting. It was probably 50 degrees and we had left Paris several days before in 94 degree heat. Yes, and and keeping the camera dry uh, in the drenching rain was was my special job. So that's 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 the that's the glamour of movie making right there, folks. <laughs> um, this is another one of those markers that we came across. This is in a tiny little chapel uh, in a little village called oh, what I'm forgetting right now, Derek. Maybe you remember? No, I don't. I don't. Near near Ham. It's right near the town of Ham. And it's right near where uh, Ronald Hoskier was killed. Uh, he, he was shot down and, um, and, and his parents, it's very interesting. He was a volunteer and flew for the Lafayette Escadrille, but he actually followed his parents into the war. They were volunteers before him. The, his father uh, drove for the ambulance corps and his mother was a nurse and they were in France before him. And he came over leaving Harvard and came over and became a pilot. And, and then unfortunately was killed. And, and they erected this little chapel in his memory. And this was a plaque that we saw there. And at the bottom it says in French, all men have two countries, his own and France. Indeed. And talk about taking one for the team. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of sacrifices to be made in a project like this. Um, really challenging circumstances that one just has to you know, really just have the intestinal fortitude to just get through one way or another. And for me, it meant going to Tahiti, um, where the daughter of James Norman Hall lives for, for part of the year. Uh, she was born, um, she was actually born in California, but she grew up in Tahiti because that's where her father retreated to after the war. Uh, he and his writing partner, uh, Charles Nordoff, um, were the famous authors of the Mutiny on the Bounty trilogy. And they built a whole live life for themselves in Tahiti, and the family carries it on. So uh, Nancy Rutgers, her his his daughter, uh, lives in a house on the hillside that he bought, and his own house is at the base of the hill, a little house museum now. And so yes, I had to suffer, uh, staying for a week in Tahiti, uh, getting to know Nancy, and um, actually pitching in at the museum, helping them with their tours. Uh, this is this is a shot of the museum uh, interior, which is his house, uh, which has his library and his typewriter and 
his record collection and his Lafayette Escadrille stuff is all there, including the watch that Raoul Lufberry was wearing when he died. And on In the right fact, uh, when Nancy and the museum staff realized Paul knew so much about James Norman Hall, Paul took over duties and led the tours. There aren't a whole lot of tourist sites in, um, in Tahiti, and so people that visit almost always visit James Norman Hall's home. And for two days, Paul was the tour guide. <laughs> Indeed. And it is a beautiful place to go. Um, and he's buried up this hillside. And it's it's his, his marker there has the first stanza of a poem that he wrote when he was 11. Um, and so that brings us to, um, away from the exotic, to the um, the very always exciting for us detective work uh, that goes into finding primary sources. We were extraordinarily fortunate in tackling this story that we were able to use the voices of the men who created the story themselves. They were excellent writers. Uh, they wrote letters, they wrote memoirs. They wrote, uh, in the case of James Norman Hall, novelized versions of the story. In, 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 we were able to work with the families and found four or five undiscovered caches of material, uh, primary source material. And Which they really that. was quite amazing. The Lafayette Escadrille is, is the most well-known story of American aviators in World War I. And the fact that we found memoirs that had not been published, photograph albums that had never been seen, and uh, newspaper clippings. And, you know, we, we took a deep dive over these four years and came up with stuff that, um, you know, even people that know the story well will be surprised at photographs they've never seen and quotes they've never heard before. So, for example, these are some photographs that um, came out of a collection of, uh, actually, of, it came out of a steamer trunk uh, that was first noticed on French eBay by a museum director in Newport, Rhode Island. And he alerted uh, Norman Prince's family because it clearly had something to do with Norman Prince. And what it turned out to be was the steamer trunk of Freddie Prince, who's there in the center of your screen, who was Norman's brother, who was also very briefly a member of the Lafayette Escadrille. Norman, of course, being one of the co-founders of the unit. And Freddie's steamer trunk that held all of his stuff from the war had vanished years before and it was discovered in 2017 in a steamer trunk in a, a french junk shop and um the great grandniece of norman prince went with a family friend who happened to be a colonel in the swiss national guard and a very big man to the junk shop and offered the junk dealer a fraction of what he was uh trying to gouge them for and uh, they got the material back. And it was an absolute treasure trove. His photo albums, his maps, his letters, his diary, all of which had never been seen before. And not by the family, not by anybody. And so for example, here is a, on the left, you see a letter from their mother, uh, who was very controlling, as was their father, uh, to Norman. Um, and uh, you'll see it says June 26, Dear Nimi. We discovered from this that that was Norman's nickname, Nimi. I feel deeply for you and all your esquadrille, poor Victor Chapman. So this is right when Victor Chapman was killed. And then she really lays on the guilts about him not being a good boy and being back in the United States and why is he throwing his life away? And what you see on the right is uh, his brother's diary uh, where he describes hearing the news of Norman's crash and then racing across France to try to get to him before he dies and then not getting there in time. And so to have that firsthand account of the death of Norman Prince told by his brother, uh, you know, we as storytellers, this is where we just get out of the way uh, because they do it so much better than they we ever could because they actually lived it. So uh, incredibly it, fortunate to have something like this. It's a real balancing act putting together a, a film like this with the necessary narration 
of giving context and setting scenes up and then having historians, family members, and then the actual pilots tell the story and uh, bridging those things together. There These are, are the contents of Kiffin Rockwell's pocket when he died. And the family had them, I believe, but only sort of came across them in 2017. So there are his hand rolled cigarettes, his watch, and a picture of his best friend, Victor Chapman. They had probably uh, known each other only four or five months, but really saw in each other a, uh, a symbiotic uh, a brother, if you will. And uh, Kiffin carried that photograph of him everywhere and until he died himself and and the cigarette case is is still crumpled from the crash uh when when uh when kiffin was shot down and the piece of wood there is the fragment of his propeller and this case was sitting in a storage unit in north carolina and was opened for the first time in 2017 there were a lot more artifacts photographs a bunch of stuff we'd never seen before so every few months or so, something would turn up and we just could not believe what was happening. Um, and again, this is why the families were so important to us and building trust with them and really following through with them was a critical part of what we were doing. And, and we've become very close with a lot of them and very fortunate for that. Which is the benefit of taking four years to make a movie. <laughs> That's true. Um, but also we got to shoot airplanes, <laughs> which is great, but also really hard to do. And it requires a lot of wrangling and a lot of insurance. <laughs> what you see here um, is our cameraman, our very brave cameraman with the 1950s seatbelt uh, on what is known as a breezy, uh, Matthew Maza. And, um, uh, flown by Andrew King, who probably has more experience with early planes and uh, experimental aircraft than anyone alive, uh, filming a, a 7 8 scale replica of a Newport 17. And there are these two crazy guys who live in Ohio and drive all through the Midwest. And the reason it's 7 8 scale is because that's just small enough to fit into a trailer where they can fly wherever, drive them and fly wherever they want to. Um, they're run with Volkswagen engines. So we actually had to put in the sound of rotary engines when we, we see them fly. But this is over the fields in Pennsylvania. And so we, we were able to film an aircraft there, uh, a, a German two-seater, which was very important for us to get because most of the descriptions of what the escadrille pilots flew against was just a, a generic German two-seater, flew against a two-seater, shot down a two-seater. We saw that over and over. Um, so it was a real challenge to get as close as we could to the right kinds of airplanes to film. Um, there are you know, your museum itself has an excellent collection of World War I aircraft. Um, and getting the French aircraft that we wanted when we needed them, it, it, was, it was quite a challenge, but, but uh, we were able to do that. Um, and part of what allowed us to do that, which you don't see in the 20 minute film, but you do see in the two hour film, is these wonderful guys in Long Island who Derek went and filmed with. And Derek, I'll let you take that part. I had made a previous film um, called The Millionaire's Unit, and uh, which dealt with the Americans that flew in the last year of the war uh, with mostly British planes. And I was able to go to New Zealand and um, film with Peter Jackson's um, uh, Air Force there, which was everything we needed. Well, we did not have that at all uh, for um, for this film. And so we we filmed planes in in France, in California in New York, at Rhinebeck, in Ohio, uh, in Dayton, and as you saw in Pennsylvania. But in the end, we did not have the German aircraft, except for that one Rumpler two-seater. We really needed German aircraft, and it was getting to be the 11th hour, and we had to finish the film for the premiere uh, last Veterans Day at the, Nas at the uh, National Museum uh, 
of the United States Air Force. And through an old college buddy, I found the Long Island Skyhawks. These guys fly one quarter and one third scale replica planes. And some of them, like the Albatross there, the second one from the right, are incredibly detailed. And these guys are not just into zooming their planes all over, they really try to fly them as looking like World War I planes at the speed. So you'll see a couple of Eindeckers there that were very important and a Newport 28 on the far right. And I spent a day and a half with these guys who could not have been more fun. And when Paul and I premiered the film in Dayton in November, they all drove out to attend the premiere and it was really fun. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, Derek briefly mentioned that we, we filmed some of the aircraft in France and we filmed some of the French Air Force as well. So on the top half of your screen, you see uh, Derek and Mathieu and our friend Eric Kircher, who very kindly took us up to shoot a Newport uh, 28 replica over Verdun. Um, and in the bottom half of the screen, you see some of the French military pilots who we filmed. Uh, on, the, on the left, a mirage uh, painted in the colors of... Um, of uh, George oh, Guinemer. George Guinemer, sorry, I lost his last name for a second, the Vieux Char. And on the right, uh, one of the pilots of the Patrouille de France, the, um, the equivalent of the Thunderbirds. Um, and these guys couldn't have been nicer. And what was amazing in talking to all the French military pilots is if we said, so we're working on the Lafayette Escadrille. Oh yeah, the Lafayette Escadrille. Yeah, Raoul Lafayette, sure. What do you want to know? They you know, instantly knew the story. And so very happy to talk to us about it and, um, and very knowledgeable. Um, so that brings us to where we are about now. So as Derek mentioned, we premiered the what we call the fine cut of the film at uh, the Air Force Museum in Dayton. Um, and here's a picture of us with our co-producer, Dan Patterson, who's from Dayton, and uh, some cutouts of, of, our, of the stars of the film. Um, and we were very fortunate enough to have several of our interviewees here, David Hanna and General Goot, uh, who came out, who flew him out from France to attend the, um, the premiere, which also included a symposium the next day about the escadrille, and, and, which featured our, our interviewees and the family members. Um, here we are with Regis de Ramel on the far left, who is related to Norman Prince. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rutgers, who I mentioned before, and standing next to Derek is Captain Georges Tenno. And Captain Georges Tenno was the uh, squadron commander of the Lafayette Escadrille, and his son Georges Tenno II was a jet engine designer for GE, and his son Georges Tenno III is a captain for American Airlines. And so uh, just to have, to be in that place with these guys was uh, was pretty great. Yeah, really fun. Um, and we were fortunate to have the sponsorship of FedEx uh, to give us the, the, the funding we needed to finish the film. So the film is complete. Um, what happened after this screening, um, and it was wonderful to see it on their giant screen, was we realized there was more to do on the film. And it, uh, so yeah. We it wasn't quite all done and we uh, in particular really need needed to redo the special visual effects uh the tracer fire and make them more subtle and make them more realistic and um happily enough uh having grown up in santa barbara we had the official premiere of the finished film at the santa barbara film festival which was really fun. I had friends from high school uh, come out to see it, um, which we didn't know what was going to happen. And um, uh, Paul and his wife came out and uh, stayed with us. And it was it was really lovely. But all of a sudden, the pandemic hit and uh, we had gotten into the Kansas City Film Festival and we didn't know whether it was going to be canceled or not. And they ended up having it online, a virtual film festival where we uh, showed it twice and uh, did, you know, these meetings, uh, having Q&As. Uh, and I'm looking to see what your next slide is going to be, Paul. Um, no, it's just about uh, where we're going next. So we, we have a finished film. Um, 
but we have run out of money and we need to make a DVD and a Blu-ray. We need to make a French language version of the film. And we also need to make an hour long version of the film because we've been told that may sell better in France. Paul and I also want to take the full film to France, which, you know, another hard task of, of film distribution, but to have a Paris premiere and also take it across the Western front and show it in all the towns in which we, in which we filmed. Uh, we've submitted several more film festivals. Most of them seem to be on hold, um, but we still have, um, you know, as an experienced documentary filmmaker told us one time, we had finished the film, congratulations, you're halfway done. So we are still fundraising. If you all know foundations or individuals that might be willing to help, um, please let us know and uh, and join us. Yes, we have um, we have to get a law firm to clear the film so we can get insurance and uh, final clearances. We owe a uh, a French archive uh, some money, um, but I'm I'm done naming all of the <laughs> done with my pity party and all the little things we still have to do. Um, but we're, we're very proud of this film and we can't wait for you all to see the finished film because. Um, without sounding immodest, uh, it really plays well for two hours. It's a powerful story with great characters, and it's the only story, uh, the story of the Lafayette Escadrille, that, that carries us through World War I from beginning to end across the Western Front. These guys fought in the trenches with the Foreign Legion for a year and a half, they drove ambulances. They really did everything except work with the Navy and then flew and then moved into the American um, uh, air, uh, air squadron in the last year of the war and finished it out. It's, it's, it's an amazing big story to tell. And we're, we're very happy with the journey that we took with it. So, yes. So as Derek said, you know, the stuff that we have to, uh, finish funding so that we can release the movie. It's it's not the glamorous stuff of movie making, insurance and legal, but very but very necessary. Um, we were incredibly fortunate to have fantastic supporters to get us this far. And we just need to get that last couple of yards across the finish line. So if any of you uh, would be interested in in contributing to the film, you can you can visit us online. The donations are tax deductible because the film is being produced by a nonprofit um, charity. And um, so that's the pitch. We, we hope that you consider that. Um, and we, uh, that's about it. So we, that is the making of the film, where we are now. Um, we're very excited to take your questions and, uh, and look forward to chatting with you. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time this evening. That was an incredible presentation. I think um, I'll, I'll speak for everyone, even though uh, I'm sure they're still typing in their questions, that it was just a really enjoyable 20 minute watch. Uh, it left me wanting more. And uh, after reviewing it, that's kind of why I was so eager to have you guys join us for a webinar, because I think it is a story that deserves to be told. It deserves to get more exposure than it perhaps has had. And uh, I think this is a group of people that can potentially help you with that because they're all people who share that that feeling, that passion and enthusiasm for military aviation. Um, we've got a couple questions here, but I think the, the first one that we're all curious about is <clears throat> what pulled the two of you together into this story? Um, how did you kind of get invested in the World War One story and specifically uh, that of the squadron when when it's not something that's broadly... Uh, you know, it's not part of the sort of popular awareness of Americans. If you don't mind, Paul, I'll, I'll launch in. Um, in 2006, a book called The Millionaire's Unit came out. And a year later, a friend from college called me and said, uh, this book came out and my grandfather was one of these pilots. Uh, what do you think of it? And we formed a nonprofit and it took us seven years and a uh, million dollars, but we raised the money and made this film of the Millionaire's Unit. And um, we took it to Oshkosh in several iterations, always trying to raise money to finish the film. And uh, I met Paul there in uh, 2011, I think we said. 
Paul had a film on the Wright brothers that he had made. We had a half hour cut of the Millionaire's Unit. And uh, we talked and got to know each other. And next time I was in Washington, D.C., I looked up Paul and we got together. And I finished uh, the Millionaire's Unit and was not done with World War I. I just turned to look at my World War I library. And, and just, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's such an important story and important history. I, I wasn't done at all. And people said, you know, why don't you make a movie of Lafayette Escudery? And I assumed it had been done. And it had not. And um, I looked up and saw that Paul had written a story for Air and Space Magazine, Smithsonian Air and Space, on the Lafayette Escadrille, and just thinking he'd be a great guy to work with, I called him up. And at that time, he and Dan Patterson, our other producer, had, had put up this display in the oldest library in America, in Newport, Rhode Island, of the Lafayette Escadrille. And I said, what about this? And the Millionaire's Unit it took so long, because it took so long to raise the money. But I wrote a letter to a foundation that had given us money, and for one letter, they gave us $250,000. And that's what took us off, got us to France the first time. And, um, and I met Paul and uh, we didn't meet in Paris. In Paris, I saw Dan for the first time. Well, we, we, we knew each other. So, and, but, but anyway, we, April of 2016, 20, uh, 20, um, um, we joined forces in Paris and started shooting. And, and as Derek said, I had done two iterations of the story already, and I've got a, a friend, a great friend who's a, who's a very accomplished documentary filmmaker, and his rule of thumb is, if you think you know the story going in, you don't. And I thought, in this case, you know what? I've written an article, I've done a, I've done a museum exhibit, I know this story. I didn't. Um, to act, I hadn't gone to France to where they had been. I hadn't, I had worked with some of the family members, but I hadn't really, gone deep. And so what we learned, and, and I think what connected Derek and I very well, is having a respect for uh, primary sources and that they know the story and you don't. And so you just have to shut up and listen to them and read and read and read and listen and listen and listen, and then try to reflect back as best as you can what you've taken in. So that it's, um, as, I, as I said to uh, a, a guy, uh, Mike O'Neill, who some of you in the audience may know, um, when I first met Mike and he said, so you're making this Lafayette Escadrille movie. And he didn't know me. And he said, so how are you approaching this? And I said, well, we're mostly just going to try and get out of the way. And he said, okay, I'll totally work with you. And, <laughs> and that, that I think has been our approach is to, is to, really listen first because then we do have the very hard job of deciding what to leave out and that is that is painful so that, that's sort of the thrilling part of documentary filmmaking uh i i wouldn't say you go on a wing and a prayer but it's like walking a tightrope so you launch into this thing having an idea you know uh, having an idea of a beginning and a middle and an end. And actually, I didn't really know what the end was gonna be because it's a pretty sad story. The Millionaire's Unit, if you all know the story, these guys got into the war late. You know, they were very accomplished guys and a lot of them went on to very accomplished lives. Not the same with the Lafayette Escadrille. These guys were really beaten down through four years of war. And so we really didn't know what the end was gonna be, but you look at a subject, is there enough archival material? Are there interesting enough people to talk to? Do you see a story arc? And then you initiate taking off on it. And and, and it it's endlessly interesting and sometimes thrilling. Yeah. So if there's questions that you have that we can answer, uh, we'd love to hear them. So I think you've actually just answered one of the other ones, which was, um, did you have the story all laid out when you arrived over there? Um, but it sounds like it, you guys kind of got out of the way and let the story evolve and let those newfound primary sources kind of shape the, the end product. We, we did, but, but there are things that catch you up. And, and 
one of the big things was that we thought no one else had really told in the histories was how much time these guys had spent on the ground in the Foreign Legion and driving ambulances. And we thought that was a really important story of the war. And one of the things we found was a memoir by Billy Dugan that had never been published. And again, these guys, most of them were educated, very good writers. Back then, that's how you communicated. And so we spent a lot of, well, we spent a lot of time trying to build that story out. And the first thing we worked on was a four hour miniseries. Our first script was over 200 pages. And we thought, well, okay, we want a mini series, we want a feature, you know, and then, you know, maybe something else. Um, so so that, that's how we went about it, looking at the whole scope of it and then said, no, we really need to focus on a film that could be seen in one sitting. And at two hours, it's still a little long, but I don't think it plays long, but, but that was part of it. So we've got a couple questions here that um, kind of relate to the movie Flyboys. Uh, now that you've had an opportunity to kind of immerse yourselves in the history of the squadron, um, can you maybe speak to your your opinion of the movie Flyboys uh, from a historical perspective? Uh, is this sure. being recorded? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, no, actually, I'm happy to speak to that because I had an epiphany about Flyboys when we were working on this movie. Um, I saw Flyboys when it came out. Actually, Andrew King, who did a lot of the uh, flew the the camera ship for a lot for our our our, our shoots in in Pennsylvania, he was one of the pilots for that. So I knew about the production of that movie when it was actually going on. And when the film came out, I actually didn't know all that much about the Lafayette Escadrille. So watching it, you know, I thought it was I thought it was okay. Um, um, I I I was dismayed at the amount of CGI that was in it and. You know, I didn't I didn't have strong feelings about it one way or another. As I got to know more about the Lafayette Escadrille, um, I will admit to becoming very snobby about the movie and thinking, ugh, you know, how could they do this? Then, you know, how they how they condense the stories and you know, condense them to just being in one place and just a small group of guys and so on and so forth, the composite characters and so on, and the the way they fictionalize it. Then when Derek and I started to write this script. The epiphany was, oh, I totally get why they did this. Because to write the actual story of who they actually were and all the storylines that happened, it's so complicated. And to make something that, as Derek says, plays well, that's coherent, um, when you've got amazing characters like Victor Chapman, Kiffin Rockwell, Norman Prince, and they die in 1916. Um, your main, some of your main, most interesting characters die. Well, that's what happens in war. So to have characters, so we had to figure out how to introduce real characters who were going to help carry our story forward after those deaths. This was a very hard part of the writing of this film. Get them introduced early enough and make them, the audience interested enough in them so that when these main characters die, we have characters who are already introduced to carry us forward, um, but then also to feel that sense of loss when characters die. And again, we got out of the way. We listened to what they actually did, what actually happened. In the case of Norman Prince, when he sailed for France at the beginning of 1915, he was on the USS Rochambeau, and on the ship with him was Edmund Genet. Edmund Genet becomes the guy who's the link for us after Norman's death. And it's they and they knew one another because they met on the ship. We could not have made that up as scriptwriters. That's what actually happened. So I think that's in so I complete if I were given the assignment of writing a fictionalized version of the Lafayette Escadrille, which James Norman Hall himself did. Um, it's called High Adventure, and he wrote it while he was there, and he fictionalized it while he was living the story. Figure that one out. Um, I completely understand why someone would take that approach to make a fiction film from that from that source material, but we were given a different task. I hope that answers the question diplomatically. 
I, I saw the film before uh, in a screening, uh, before it was released. I was going to maybe write an, an article about it. And, uh, and this is before I knew anything about World War I aviation. And, um, and I saw what they were doing. Obviously, the film was for a much younger audience. Um, and, and, you know, when Hollywood puts a lot of money behind a film, they want it to appeal to as many people as possible. And so they made a bunch of decisions that I did not find very satisfactory. You know, to me, the, the characters were kind of one dimensional and the story not terribly interesting. But I, even at the time, without knowing anything about World War I aviation, I was really bothered by the CGI of all the flying scenes. They, they just seemed ridiculous. And I've understood later that this was something that the director, Tony Bill, didn't want to do, but that his producer really wanted to do. And our friend Andrew King flew for four months, I think, working on the film, and they used hardly anything of, of what he did. So, you know, you know it, it was a completely different animal than, than what we're doing. We're, we're trying to tell, you know, an historically accurate story. You know, it, it's, it's kind of the same thing that happened with William Wellman in the film The Lafayette Escadrille in um, 1960, was it? In, in the late 50s, which I still have never seen. But William Wellman flew in World War I. He made the movie Wings, which is probably still the best Hollywood film of World War I aviation. And, you know, he ran into trouble with Samuel Goldwyn, and they wanted to do a story that they thought were going to appeal to everybody, and they ended up appalling the, um, you know, the World War I aviation community. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I was not a big fan of the film, though I love Jean Reno, and, um, you know, I love the story. Um, uh, it was it was not my cup of tea, but you know I'm a documentary filmmaker, and, and I I you know luckily am not well I don't know luckily or not, but I'm not working with you know million dollar decisions hanging over my head regarding how I um, position a picture and execute it. Um, and I apologize, everyone. I realize that something has gone wrong with my camera, and it is showing um, an auxiliary camera, so I've stopped sharing my camera for the moment. I apologize for that. I don't know why that's the case. It's uh, no problem at all. We can still hear you. Um, so another question kind of following on to this discussion of popularizing history, um, it seems clear that you know, as you, as you traveled across France, the story was well known and and remembered by people there. And you guys kind of touched on this earlier that World War One is something of an abstraction for a lot of American audiences, and and maybe not something that that people readily connect with. Um, if there was one thing to glean from what you learned and and what you assembled in the documentary that you could use to get Americans excited about this story or to make it their story, um, what would it be? Uh, well, this is maybe more from my research on World War I than, than actually filming. But um, several of the books I read, uh, Americans don't remember World War I very much because it was not, it was not a heroic war. Uh, there was no Battle of Gettysburg. There, there were no big, exciting turns in the battle. Uh, they got there late. It wasn't their battle though America had a very decisive uh, effect in ending the war. Uh, I don't think the war would have ended the way um, would have ended with the Allies victorious without America. But uh, Americans were principally caught up in the Meuse-Argon campaign, which was a bloody, bloody slog that went on for several months. And there was nothing dynamic or historic about it. It was really hard work and it was really traumatic, you know, uh, certainly for the French and Germans too, fighting in the first industrial war where just the carnage was was really hideous. So that's that's part that's part of the problem of why people don't address World War I. But it is also, I, I would argue, the second biggest incident in forming us as a nation, second to the Civil War. Uh, really because Europe wiped itself out and uh, the Allies depended very much on us during the war before we got into it just for our resources. Our Industrial Revolution came a little late. We had all of these resources to offer 
Uh, it fairly industrialized the United States. Uh, we turned from a basically rural uh, society into a very urban society with people coming in and it allowed uh, to work in the factories and in the cities. And it really allowed us to step out onto the world stage and become the world power that we did for the 20th century uh, because Germany, uh, because Europe had really destroyed itself. Uh, so, so that was the big turning point. Um, as far as aviation goes, it wasn't that big a part of World War I. Uh, the huge advance was really reconnaissance, was really because um, it, 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 it really was the end of the, the horse uh, cavalry um, because airplanes could do reconnaissance so much better. So when people talk about World War I aviation, generally, you know, they talk about the flying aces and how many planes they shot down. But really much more important than that was just the presence of the planes in the air. And one of our historians in the film says, you know, there were, there were uh, 38 members, and Paul, I may get it wrong, but 25 of them didn't even shoot down a single plane. But the fact that they were in the sky and showing their presence and intimidating the Germans and letting the photographic planes go on and do their work really made uh, a big difference in a number of the battles. But, but the, the main and awful bloody part of the war was, um, was filmed on the ground. I'm, sure I, I'm sorry I skipped around a, a great deal, but um, I hope that answered part of the question. It, it certainly did. Um... We've got a large collection, as you mentioned, of, of World War I uh, aircraft here. By and large, as with many collections of, of aircraft of that vintage, they are replicas. Um, were you actually able to feature any original World War I veteran airplanes? You mentioned that you traveled to, to Rhinebeck, and obviously that is home to, to several of those airplanes. Uh, were you able to feature any in the film, in the full-length version of the film? Uh, there is a collection in California, in uh, Paso Robles, the um, aeroplane collection. And there's uh, several dozen planes in the collection, all of which have original engines in them. Now, World War I planes, as you all know, uh, almost all of them were, you know, were framed in wood and covered in, in cotton, uh, you know, with, uh, with paint on them. And so, uh, hardly any of them survived. However, in the World War, in, in the aeroplane collection, uh, was an original Sopwith Camel, original engine, original wooden bone structure, original canvas, and that has since been dedicated to the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum and is at the Udvarhazy uh, Museum. It's from the collection of Javier Arango. Yeah, so we didn't actually have um, any original aircraft in in the film. There's only, as far as I know, there's only one original Newport 11 in the world, and that's at the um, uh, Musée de l'Air Espèce at, in, at Le Bourget in Paris. And um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's hard to find them. Um, but we did get some excellent, um, there's a collection called uh, at a, at a place called La Ferté Allée in Paris, and um, there were some excellent um, uh, videographers uh, who who filmed those aircraft, and we were able to license footage from them. So it was it was a bit of a patchwork putting those sequences together in a way that uh, cinematically made sense and was as accurate as we possibly could. But uh, sometimes in our film. Um, the role of the Newport 11 is played by a Newport 17, and and uh, you know, had we a much much bigger budget, uh, we would have um, decided to uh, you know perhaps we could have uh, had everything be absolutely accurate, um, but uh, you know we we used what we had, and and what's important is to get across the moments and feelings of the story, um, and to one of the ways we solved that, I know in your collection there at the uh, Military Aviation Museum, you have an outstanding collection of paintings by Henri Faré, the French painter. And uh, so, for example, the uh, very important bombing run to Ormendorf, which is the last mission of Norman Prince, where Nor Laurel Lufbery becomes an ace. Um, we used a little bit of archival footage to introduce the mission, 
but then the rest of the mission is illustrated using Farhai paintings, and it's very effective. So we had to be yeah. creative, and, and that's what you got to do when you have uh, limited resources and uh, what wonderful uh, source material to work from. But in our full-length film, uh, you will see on the ground a Newport 11 uh, starting up and a SPAD 13 starting up. And both of those planes have original engines in them. Yes. As so Javier Arago told me, he said, there are only a limited number of original engines in the world, and we all know where they are. It's it's certainly a, an incredible collection out there, and uh, you know one one that I think many folks would would benefit from seeing. Um, there is there is a school of thought that says you know some nothing just quite sounds like the original engines, and that it's kind of like you know making sure you have the original heart of the airplane installed. Uh, could you guys speak yeah. to the logo design for the, the for the squadron and and the significance of it? Certainly. Um, so the 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 Indian head insignia uh, was adapted was adopted in late 1916, as I recall, um, and this was a time when the Escadrille was forced to change its name. It had been originally known as the Escadrille American, so the American Escadrille. Um, uh, the United States was still neutral at this point in the war, and there was a. Uh, a opposition to these American volunteers from uh, supporters of the German side of the war in the United States. Uh, you know, the United States was neutral. So there was this debate going on internally here, and the German uh, government complained to the United States that you cannot have, you know, you're neutral. What's this American escadrille? And so they changed the name to the Escadrille de Volontaire, which is the least interesting uh, squadron name, I think, of all time the volunteer escadrille. So they, uh, in our research, it we found, you know, it could have been any one of about three, or maybe four people who put forward the idea of naming it the Lafayette Escadrille, but that's a perfect name because it really ties together that sense of, of uh, they're wanting to be a tie back to Lafayette. And well, um, uh, Paul, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I don't think gets enough credit because he had written an article about the flying Lafayette. And as far as we could tell, that was the first mention of the name. Yes. But uh, I don't know when Kiffin Rockwell um, made his famous quote of, you know, I pay my way for Ro for Lafayette and Rochambeau. Right. So it was at about at this time that they decided that they needed an insignia. Uh, something painted on their aircraft that was distinctive that was instantly recognizable as being American and that let everybody know that they were all part of a cohesive unit. And, and they, they couldn't were, use an American flag. They were forbidden from using the American flag. So uh, they were inspired by the logo on a box of ammunition that they had, that had uh, what was termed a Seminole Indian uh, warrior. And uh, later they adapted that to the uh, version that we had there in our presentation, which was actually drawn by two of the members of the squadron who were both Harvard trained architects. And so they uh, adapted the insignia in late 1916, 1917, and that's what it became. Um, you know, right in our current climate, it's, it's you know, could be very easily seen as something of some controversy, you know, appropriating a Native American uh, symbol. Uh, there is a swastika in the war bonnet of the warrior depicted in the insignia. Um, at the time that that was uh, painted and adapted, uh, that symbol had nothing to do with uh, the Nazis because the Nazis didn't exist. That's uh, the swastika, as most of you know, is a, a symbol that goes back across cultures back for millennia. Um, it has more to do with good luck uh, in this context than anything else. Um, so flash forward to 2016 and the rededication of the memorial, the chief of the Oglala Sioux, Chief John Yellowbird Steele, came to Paris uh, to participate in the ceremony with his war bonnet, with his full war bonnet, almost identical to what's in the um, uh, insignia, 
and he spoke at in front of the huge crowd about um, the adoption of the war bonnet and the warrior as this symbol, the most American thing they could find, and how they were proud in this case that that was um, that they had done what they'd done. For those of you interested in Native American history, I don't know who named the first logo a Seminole warrior, but the Seminole in Florida were the only Indian tribe that was never completely defeated by the United States Army, and they hung on and stayed in Florida and are still in Florida. But the the illustration, the war bonnet, looks nothing like what the Seminole wore. And then the redesign was termed to be a Sioux, Indian warrior who were one of the last Plains Indians that really fought the army, uh, you know, very, very hard. And William Thaw said, uh, you know, th this is the most American warrior symbol we can think of. And I would almost say that's still pretty much true. And in fact, the, uh, the French Air Service has continued to use that insignia uh, from that time. Um, even through the resistance in World War II, um, to the Cold War, and to today, uh, that's that insignia is still on the Mirage jets that's, that that are flying. Yep. I hope that was a satisfactory answer. Oh, absolutely. Um, we've got a, a really interesting question that's just come in. Um, with America being neutral, it's it's easy to understand why. A uh, group of people would would travel overseas and fight on behalf of France, you know, understanding that there was a debt to be repaid from from the American Revolution and so on. Uh, was there a sort of equivalent unit in the German military? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, of Americans, uh, y yes, I, actually, uh, not not a unit, but um, there were. I looked deep into Yale because my former. Uh, movie the uh, millionaires unit uh, those were all Yale guys and yes there were a few German American uh, Yale students who went to Germany to fight uh, not, not enough to form a squadron and um, and as you know there was a very large German American population in America at the time and there were several German American newspapers but uh, I don't think they and and there was a lot of German uh, espionage that went on during World War one but um, as far as I know, there weren't enough German Americans that went to Germany and formed a squadron or a fighting force. Yeah, and and um, also we should we should note that you know the the, the Lafayette Escadrille was the squadron that had 38 Americans in it, but there were um, close to 270 Americans who flew in other French escadrilles. Um, and they were known as the Lafayette Flying Corps. And then when you add in the number of Americans who were driving ambulances, the number of Americans who were in the French Foreign Legion, um, uh, the, the Americans who joined on the volunteered on the side of the British, like James Norman Hall actually started there. Um, you know, there was there was there was a lot more volunteer uh, activity on the Allied side of the war from American volunteers uh, than on the German side. Uh, this book is biographies of all of the Americans that flew for France in World War One by Dennis Gordon. There you go. So, um, natural. This this story has a lot of parallels with, say, the American Volunteer Group, better known as the Flying Tigers, and so on. Ultimately, you know, a lot of the 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 original cast of characters associated with the Flying Tigers had trouble integrating into regular military life uh, once the U.S. showed up on scene in China. Um, can you speak a little bit about the the transition uh, that was made by this squadron towards the end of the war? It didn't go well, generally. Um, <laughs> sure. a, a few people became... Um, was it Edward uh, Hinkle, Paul, that became the very successful architect? Uh, but but James Norman Hall, whom we've spoken about, who wrote the Mutiny of the Bounty trilogy and many other novels, and was a poet, he never flew a plane again uh, when he was done with World War One, and well, he didn't really okay. want to be around people, which is why he went to Tahiti, and um, he had well, a very difficult time. I'm sorry, if Paul. Could, sorry, if I could interrupt, I think your question is more about how they transitioned to the American Air Service. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. No, that's that's okay. No, take it. No, yeah, you go ahead. You've thought about it. 
<laughs> Not really. Uh, well, I know it. We both know it. Um, so the transition to the American Air Service was was bumpy, certainly at the beginning, to put it kindly. Um, the American Army was uh, trying to live up to the promises it had made to the Allies of, of providing an enormous number of men and aircraft uh, already trained, and and it was not, um, it didn't go smoothly. Um, they, uh, so so a lot of, you know, almost silly things happened. For example, um, Ted Parsons says that when they were all uh, 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 examined by the medical examiners for the uh, American Air Service to make the transition, they were all flunked as being unqualified to be combat pilots because they had various physical ailments. They were too old. One was blind in one eye. Uh, William Thaw was had a had a wounded arm that he couldn't lift a certain height. Ralph Lufbery couldn't walk backwards along a straight line. So you know they 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 had this very awkward transition into the air service. There were bureaucratic reasons. Most of them were not commissioned officers, and yet all the American pilots coming into the air service were commissioned officers. So what did, how could we have these veterans who have more experience be subordinate to pilots who didn't have any experience? Raoul Lufberry, who was their top ace, got a desk job at first. So it was it was awkward. But by the time 1918 and the American presence in the war was really as in full swing as it got, um, several of them had risen to become really true mentors to the young Americans who were starting to fly. Ralph Lufberry being the best example, but James Norman Hall, uh, same thing. Ray Bridgman, who we mentioned earlier, this pacifist who, who was dead against the war but joined it anyway, became a squadron commander. And if any of you are familiar with the SPAD 13 that's in the Air and Space Museum, Smith 4, uh, the pilot who flew that, I looked at his records, he flew for Ray Bridgman. And there are all these photographs of Captain Ray, Captain Ray, who's the bravest of us all, who always leads us in first, um, and that kind of thing. So they really cut these leadership figures once they, all the bureaucratic wrangling and clumsiness got past them and they were actually in the air service, they had these positions of being mentors. Eddie, Eddie Rickenbacker was mentored by Raoul Lufberry and, and claimed that he learned everything that he knew from Raoul Lufberry. There's a famous story of, of uh, that Rickenbacker wrote, uh, talking about going over the lines for the first time and Lufberry taking him and, uh, and then when, and being terrified of the, the flak and you know just all the experiences that he went through on this first trip and when he got back, Rickenbacker sort of played it off as oh yeah it was nothing I I know exactly what I'm doing I'm now a seasoned combat veteran. Lufberry said so um, did you what did you see and Rickenbacker said well no one we didn't see anybody and Lufberry rattled off the Allied planes they'd seen the enemy planes they'd seen and and then pointed out the number of holes that Rickenbacker had in his airplane. He didn't even know he'd been shot. <laughs> so, uh, so these guys really played that part. But it was clumsy at first, for sure. So I, I think uh, that, that more than satisfactorily answers the question. I, I think we'd like to go back to Derek and have him speak just a little bit more about life after World War One for the crews as, as he was doing. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, they didn't have post-traumatic stress disorder um, back then. Uh, they called it shell shock. And generally, I, I think in the ground troops, it was looked at as uh, just guys that didn't have the metal, uh, that were weaker, um, that just didn't have what it took. And um, and unfortunately, I, I think a lot of the guys in the Lafayette Escadrille really suffered for that and from that. And it wasn't shell shock. But people at the time didn't understand what the effects of flying planes and changing altitude uh, did to, you know, the physiology uh, of a person. And, you know, these guys would fly up to 16, 18, sometimes 20,000 feet uh, several times a day going up and down. And uh, we, we have a sequence in the, uh, in the film showing photographs of Kiffin Rockwell, uh, showing him in April. And then showing him in August of 2016, and uh, you know, he literally it looks like he's aged 
20 years, 25 years. It was really debilitating. Um, plus the, the strain. I mean, you can, read, uh, you can read their accounts. They really talk about it in their letters and in their diaries, what a severe thing it was to do. And as we mentioned, Ray Bridgman committed suicide. Uh, William Thaw, uh, you know, he became a lieutenant colonel, was the most decorated American aviator, and came home and worked in his dad's insurance uh, company, flew a little bit, became a bad alcoholic, and died of bad health at 40 years of age. And he was the stalwart, energetic, big, um, tough guy of the unit that everyone looked up to. Um, it was it was really tough, you know. Uh, one guy died in the gutter in Washington D.C. Um, it uh, it really took a toll uh, took a toll on them. Uh, uh, go ahead, Paul. I was going to make another example, which I've I've forgotten about. Well, some of them some of them did thrive after the war, but it it almost seemed like they were trying to outrun it. Uh, James Norman Hall was very explicit about the fact that he went to live on what he called this little speck of earth in Tahiti. And he never really, I mean, he visited the United States again, but he never went back to Europe. He found in Tahiti the closest thing he could find to rural Iowa in terms of its isolation and where he could find solitude. And that was, that's what kept him sane. And, and his daughter told me that. Um, and uh, Ted Parsons, after the war, he was, um, yeah, my God, what Ted Parsons did after the war, he was a private detective, he was an FBI agent, he was a radio personality, he worked on Hollywood films, um, and then when the Second World War started, he uh, joined the Navy and he uh, served in the Pacific and retired a year or two after the war as a rear admiral. Um, all, and, and when I talked to his granddaughter, um, you know, she we actually didn't interview her because she said, I didn't really know him. He was on the run all the time and just <laughs> moving, moving, moving. So Harold Willis became this famous ecclesiastical architect after the war and seemed to have returned to a very normal life, uh, you know, had a thriving career. But so many of them, um, the majority of them, I say, I would say, really struggled after the war. Um, died young, had a lot of health problems, um, and 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 certainly the, they were well known. Um, over four thousand men, by one calculation, um, in between the wars, claimed to have been in the Lafayette Escadrille, which is, you know, over a thousand times the number of men who are actually in it. So um, it, it, Harold. Harold Willis, the architect, was accused of uh, going AWOL because he was on a on a mission and going home, and he thought, "Oh, I want to fly to Chart and fly over the cathedral and take a look at it," which he did, and you know, flew home hours late. Everyone thought he was shot down. But if anyone wants to read an extremely entertaining and you know, no, not terribly accurate, but but nothing made up book about the Lafayette Escadrille, Ted Parsons' book. I think first called The Great Adventure, and then I Flew with the Lafayette Escadrille is a really fun read. It really it really covers everything. It covers their alcoholism. It covers the the cold they had to deal with. Uh, you know, they would, every two months or so, they would go to a different, um, you know, air station, and sometimes there was nothing built there, you know, and they had canvas tents and maybe a cop they could sleep on and uh and he documents it all it's really a good book he's very forthright he does talk about um how they would drink before they flew how they would drink while they were flying and how they drank as soon as they got back on the ground so an incredibly stressful um experience for them and he was the only pilot that did not jo join the u.s air service he just thought there was too much red tape and he also thought that he had not given France everything he owed them for the money they spent on it. So he, he transferred to the uh, Sagonia squadron, the, the Stork squadron of Georges Guinemer. And in the end, he uh, had eight victories of German planes he shot down. Gentlemen, this will be our last question for this evening. Um, Derek, you've got an extensive World War One library at hand. Um, is there perhaps a good 
general history of World War One aviation that you might be able to recommend that also stands up to, to scholarly scrutiny? Uh, well, scholarly scrutiny, certainly anything by John Keegan, uh, who is a big war historian, but, but very special uh, in particular to World War One. And I can't remember the, well, here, yeah, here it is. Uh, the First World War by John Keegan. Uh, Martin Gilbert also wrote a very good book on it. I really like this book, The Doughboys, um, written by a guy that became a Hollywood screenwriter, uh, Lawrence Stallings. The Do Doughboys, the story of the American Expe Expeditionary Force, 1917-1918. And uh, hold on. I have a photograph of him. Of course, this is just about the American group, but uh, that is him. He lost a leg in World War I and went on to write, um, I've forgotten, he may have written The Big Parade. Um, a very good book about just being on the ground are the notebooks of a barrel maker, um, Louis Barthas, uh, and he fought throughout the war and survived. And he's really a very good, vivid writer. Um, there are so many books. Um, if I could jump in, one of the one of the one of the things that was so difficult for us is, as we said over and over, the Escadrille pilots were such good writers. All of them, except well, uh, William Thaw, who's the only one who served from the very beginning to the very end, um, and uh, his letters stop somewhere in 1915, and we don't have anything to go on from that. So, what I would recommend in terms of a general book on World War One aviation is um uh boy there's 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 a lot of really good books on world war one aviation uh as general books that cover both sides of the war what the germans were doing what the british were doing the french and and you know there's such different courses of development through the war you know the british lost more in training than they did in combat um the french had a very different way of training their pilots the germans were up against you know, tremendous um, industrial challenges as as you know they were losing resources as the war went on. So it's it's a it's a very compl complex story. So in terms of a good single book on World War One aviation, Derek, what would you recommend? Um, I'm going to have to dig into it, and I've forgotten his name, Samuel uh, Professor Emeritus at um, Princeton. Um, the the unsubstantial air uh, the what the in, the insubstantial air the the unsubstantial unsubstantial air by um by high slop is his name uh it's it's a really good book for the lafayette escadrille uh this is maybe almost the most accurate book you could read by philip flammer uh but one of our favorites which is also very accurate and almost novelistic is this one by Herbert Malloy Mason. Uh, both these guys, Flammer and Mason, were pilots and can really write authoritatively about what it was like to fly. And they went to the places, they knew the guys, they interviewed them. Um, I was asked earlier today, are there any recordings of the Lafayette Escadrille pilots? And I got in touch with Herbert Malloy Mason's daughter because his sources in the back say that, you know, he recorded interviews with the Lafayette Escadrille pilots, and she said, my dad died a couple years ago, and I'll go through a storage unit, and she did and found nothing. Mm. So, yeah, so, um, but, yeah, so it's it's such a multifaceted thing. Um, I'm sorry we're not coming up with a, with a snappy answer for you in a single good book. There are a lot of good general books on, Laf on um, World War I aviation um, that you can look at. So. Um, I, I I wish I could be a little bit more specific than that. One of my favorite books is by uh, Robert Wool, who is an who is an emeritus professor at UCLA, and this is really about the birth of aviation and how it took Europe by storm, and it it follows the influence of aviation in art, literature, and music, and has fantastic photographs and paintings. Uh, from which we we uh, used a good number in our documentary. 
Well, guys, that uh, that more than answers that question. I think you've given us all books to go and search for, and uh, I know that's all certainly appreciated at a time when a lot of our volunteers here at the museum are still choosing uh, social distancing and are, and are safer at home, uh, and again, are able to log self-study hours uh, during this period. So I'm sure there will be a great many of those books you've described uh, procured from Abe Books or Amazon over the next few days. Uh, but that concludes our program tonight, so I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank both of you so much, um, not just for your time this evening, but for the time you've invested in, in sharing this incredible piece of history. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome, Keegan, and, and everybody, and thanks so much for tuning in and your interest. And again, we can't wait to get the film out to everybody. It's, it's going to be a couple more months. Yes, and we, we would ahead, certainly Paul. love to come to your museum and show the film there. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to add, Keegan, that my parents met in Norfolk, Virginia. My dad was in the UDT and my mom grew up in Norfolk and uh, my aunt lived in Virginia Beach for years. So I'm, I'm very familiar with your area and would love to come back. Have a great evening and uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And uh, gentlemen, we hope to host you here at the museum in, in short order as soon as the world is, is back to some semblance of normal. Indeed, Keegan. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. Thank bye you. Bye bye, all. Bye bye. Thanks.